it's Flo, and this is my impression of a drill instructor directing a musical. Town hut! Get those tap heels in line and let me see those jazz hands! Are you bundling your home and auto insurance through Progressive? Can you hear me through those sequins? Bundle your home and auto through Progressive and save. Left, left, left and step ball change. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates. Home insurance provided and serviced by other select insurers. Blog Talk Radio. Good afternoon and welcome to the Parenting Aces Radio Show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, coming at you live from Atlanta, Georgia, this Thanksgiving week. And we are having gorgeous fall weather here, finally, in Atlanta. I thought summer was going to go on for ever here, but we finally got some cooler temperatures and the trees have started to turn and it's just absolutely beautiful. My kids are all in in town for Thanksgiving, which is like that hasn't happened in a year. So I'm pretty excited to have everybody here. And uh, besides having some technical issues with my phone and my laptop this week, everything else is glorious and just happy to be with you all this week and um, bring you today's guest, Todd Whittem, who, for those of you who have been following Parenting Aces, hopefully you've read Todd's contributions to ParentingAces.com. He's written several articles for us. He is a coach down in Florida, junior coach, and works with very small groups of players at a time. He um, purposefully does not take on a ton of juniors. He is very discerning in the players he works with, as he discussed in our last podcast. So um, if you haven't listened to part one of my interview with Todd, I hope you'll check that out. But as a result of doing that last interview, Todd and I decided that it would be a good idea to have him come on every month because he's really got some great information to share about coaching at the junior level. He coaches kids who are at all levels of the game, including ones that are already in college who come home to work with him on break. And I actually had the opportunity to watch one of his collegiate players a couple weeks ago when I was in Minneapolis. And I forgot to mention that to Todd. So um, we can talk about that a little bit too. But um, let me just go ahead and bring him on the air since uh, we've only got an hour today and I know we've got a lot to talk about. So Todd, thanks so much for tuning in, um, for joining us this week. And um, really quickly, I want to just tell the readers, if you guys are not following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I hope you will go ahead and sign up to do that because I do post links to some interesting articles, some of which Todd has actually written or links to things on his website. So I hope you will go ahead and follow us on the various social media outlets so you don't miss any of those good little tidbits of information. So, sorry, Todd. Hi. Thanks for being with us. (laughs) Hello, Lisa. I'm happy to be back again. And uh, I think we have some great topics uh, for the parents to – to, to listen to, and uh, you know, I'm excited to be here once again. Awesome. Well, let's not uh, delay because we've talked about your background and stuff. We did that in part one, and so um, the folks that are that missed that part one, they can go back and listen to the beginning of of that podcast if they want to hear more about your personal tennis journey. Um, and I encourage people to do that. But let's not spend time today talking about that stuff. Let's jump in to the meat of today's topics. And the first thing that you and I were going to talk about are ITF tournaments. And you had some very strong thoughts about the ITF junior circuit and what you're seeing at that level. And I'd love to hear from you. Well, yeah, I would uh, I'd obviously love to talk about the ITF tournaments as I've had quite a few parents uh, come up to me, whether I train their child or not, and ask me what my opinion was of the ITF tournaments. Um, you know, obviously, if your child is first starting with ITF tennis tournaments, they're going to start at the grade four, grade five level. And many of the children, you know, are going through their, their junior tennis career, playing sectionals and nationals, even locals into sectionals and nationals. And then maybe someone's you know, tells them that they need to maybe go the ITF route or they need to chase points or, 
college coaches, they want you to play ITF tennis tournaments to get international experience. And so I just wanted to give my thoughts on really what I thought of the ITF tennis tournaments and how to manage them. And if I actually thought that they were a great idea for a lot of the kids to be going to different parts of the world to be playing in these lower level ITF tennis tournaments, especially to get started with their junior tennis career. So, you know, basically I've had parents come to me after I've trained their child and they have wanted to pursue the ITF tennis circuit. And many times I've said, I don't think it's a good idea. And some of you that are listening, they're, you're, you're thinking really all my, a lot of my coaches are telling me that I need my child to go play ITF tennis tournaments and get that international exposure. And one of my, one of my first responses is, first of all, you want to be going step by step. And so if you're, if your child is struggling in either local events or maybe sectional events, then I don't really see, you know, really a reason for them to be venturing out and going to the Caribbean and playing lower level ITF tennis tournaments for various reasons. It could, it could be very costly, but I always think of training a child and managing a, a junior tennis player to be the best that they can. And so what, what I'm really seeing is there's a lot less matches being played in those ITF tennis tournaments. They're spending a lot of time out there in the, maybe in the Caribbean or other parts of the world. And in my opinion, the child should be training a lot more than just going for a couple events and, and a couple of weeks out to chase points all around the world. I, I don't think that that's always the best, the best case scenario for them to become the best tennis player that they can. Um, now it's a different story. Maybe if you're from, a country outside of the United States where there's limited tournaments and you have to go out and you have to play ITF tennis tournaments. I, I could totally understand that because really you've, you've outgrown what's in your country. And, and that, that's, that's something that is, you know, obviously is, is totally acceptable. And I, and that that's the route that many of the foreign tennis players have to take, but I'm not really seeing that with the American tennis players and, and really I, I like the USTA tournaments because you're, you're going to be playing a certain amount of matches during many of the tournaments on, it could be a Saturday, Sunday, and a Monday, and you're playing a lot of matches in that short term. So when you come back to training, you're not missing that whole week. When you go to an ITF tennis tournament, you, you may have to qualify on, on a Saturday, and then the main draw is on Monday if your child qualifies, and then you have you'll play a match on Monday, then you'll have a day off, then you'll have a match on, Tuesday, on on Wednesday, and then maybe Thursday or however far your child gets in the tennis tournament. And really, to me, that's just a lot of lost time that they could be training and improving their skills. Um, now, if you have a lot of money and you want your child to be going the ITF tennis route, then if you're going to send a coach with them, you know, there's a lot of time that the child could be training during these tennis tournaments, but then the child wants to be fresh for their matches. And so you run into problems with, you know, making sure that they're fresh for their matches. And, and so then you can't really train like you train at home. So for me, you know, just, just from management perspective with, with junior tennis players, I don't really think it's, it's the best route unless that you've, you've dominated so much in your, in your area and, and maybe nationally that really the only other place to go is to go through these lower level ITF tournaments. And then you go to the higher level ITF tournaments in a, in a very quick route. And so then you're playing very, very high level tennis players that, that I, that I could understand. Or if there really isn't anything to play and, and something, and one of these tournaments are in your area, maybe a, a boy from Florida you know, could have gone to the Atlanta ITF or South Carolina. So those are close and maybe they didn't have any other options to play tournaments. I, I could understand that, but I think there's a lot of, a lot of time lost when you're going out chasing these points. And um, I think the management could be a lot better for many of these tennis players. And, and plus it, re it really shows that if a child is not going out and dominating these events, then I'm not really sure that they should be traveling these distances to be playing you know, kind of, kind of lower level competition. I don't, I don't really see, I don't really see the benefit of that. I, I think a lot of parents, they get very excited because they hear the word international, but really many of the players that are playing the grade fours and the grade fives, they're no better. And, and, 
and really a lot of them are, are lower level than what you'll find in your sectional tennis tournaments locally. So you're going to save a lot, a lot of money by really playing your local, local tournaments and trying to do very well in those. Let me play devil's advocate for a second because um, I had very minimal exposure to the ITF junior circuit with my kid. And one of the things, the very first ITF he went to, uh, he went with a coach. I didn't go. And one of the things that I thought the coach did really well was the coach made sure to find matches for my son once he was out of the tournament because they had flown to, to travel to the tournament. So, it, you know, they had a set return date, so they were stuck there. And so the coach did a really good job of finding kids for my son to play that were international, you know, that he wasn't normally going to get to play against. And I thought that was a really effective way to manage that trip. Um, so that my son did get some benefit out of it. But the flip side of that is with the ITF tournaments, it's one and done. So once you lose, you're out. That's it, the end. And um, like you said, Todd, if you spent all this money to, to travel to play one match, um, that can be very frustrating and infuriating, um, not to mention a blow to the pocketbook. Right. Well, the, the way that I look at I look at these tournaments, if if a child is going out to play the grade fours and grade fives ITF tennis tournaments, it, it's really to go out and get a lot of points to to really go very far in the tournaments, uh, semifinals, finals, or winning. If your child is losing early in those tennis tournaments, that should be a huge red flag that maybe there's something wrong. You, you know, in my opinion, you don't go to these tournaments. To, to, to develop your game into becoming a much better player because the matches really are limited. There's not a lot of matches over, it could be a week or even longer if your child has to qualify. So really it's, it's a point chasing scheme to really go to much higher levels of ITF tournaments. Now, if your child is a very, very high level and their federation, your child's federation wants to pay for that, then okay, at least it's not coming out of the parents' uh, pockets, um, then that's okay. I mean, obviously, the federations, a lot of them have their, have their uh, students or junior tennis players going and playing these ITF tennis tournaments. But really, if, if, these, if these children are, their, are the country's best tennis players and they're really high level, they're not going to be in these tournaments very long. Um, in terms of, you know, Lisa, your, your child going and having – you know, maybe a variety of practice matches, then, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's okay. But really, depending on the schedule of, of your son at that time, you know, it may, it may have been more beneficial for him maybe to train with his coach or maybe to play sets. I, you know, I can't say. But, right. um, you know, I mean, you, you didn't want to change your flight, obviously. It was probably really costly. So, you know, but what I can also tell you is that at, at a tournament, it's a much different environment training at a tournament than it is at home at home you can put in the hours and train and courts could be very very limited so you know depending on depending on the court availability maybe you only get one hour and so you can only play one set so that that's that's not really a match it's you know and i can and i remember this from when i was right. playing on the atp tour you did your work at home when you went to the tournaments that was to win as many matches as you could but the work was, was done at home. And then on the road, you were trying to maintain, obviously your level of tennis, your level of fitness. It's really not an, it's not a place to become a much better tennis player. The, to become a much better tennis player is when you're training, you know, at, at home. Sure. Sure. One other aspect of the ITF juniors though, that um, at least, you know, for us and, and my child never traveled outside the country to play. He played, one in Texas and, and one here in Atlanta. So um, that was a no-brainer. Um, right. Was, you know, just having the experience. Um, for some of these kids, you know, they, they want the experience of trying these different types of tournaments, these different levels of play. And, you know, for my, my son, like, he – 
at his second, the first ITF was a disaster, and I've written about that, and people can look it up on parentingaces.com. It was, it was just, he right. was so nervous, um, whatever. But um, the one in Atlanta, he won, he got, he had to go through qualifying, he got through qualifying, and he won a couple rounds in the main draw, and wound up finishing his junior career with an ITF junior ranking. And for him, that was important. You know, that was something he right. wanted to accomplish. And so um, from that perspective, I was okay with it. You know, I thought, well, this is one more area of junior tennis that we can explore at relatively little cost, relatively little um, cost in terms of missed school. And so it was okay. Another point I want to just bring up, too, since you're talking about, you know, that you do your work at home, and i that's a fantastic statement. I love that. Um, is these kids, when they are traveling to these ITF tournaments and, and they know that it's one and done and they know that it's cost a lot of money to get there, you know, maybe that added pressure, uh, depending on the kid, is – you know, can make or break the decision of whether or not to try this route. You know, can your kid handle that pressure of knowing that, hey, you know, it's it's costing you in terms of missed school, missed, missed training, it's costing mom and dad money. If you don't win your match, we've done all this and you've played one match and you're out, you know. And a lot of kids aren't ready for that kind of pressure. Right. I, I agree with that. 100%. Um, if, 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 if your child, if your child is potentially one and done in, in these types of tournaments, or maybe they win a match and then they lose a match, I'm not sure how well they're doing in their, in their local tennis tournaments. So I, I don't know why that they would venture out to be playing these types of tournaments. When I was, I was brought up in, in my junior tennis career that you go through step by step by step. And so maybe you started a local tournament as a youngster and you have to win that local tournament, right? Or, or what, you know, whenever you, you play them and then you go to a little bit higher of a, a higher level of a local tournament. And then maybe you go to your sectional and you have to try to win your sectional. So you're proving yourself at each level. Now, if you all of a sudden are winning your sectionals and then you're winning your smaller national tennis tournaments and you're running out of competition, then I understand you may have to take another route. Now, then you have to look at what the best route is for, for your child and really what, what you want, what the child wants out of their tennis career. Do they want to try to be the best they can be? Or do they want to play some international competition and then, and then go, to, go to college? And it just all depends on the route. So, the route that, that I took, for example, was the route that I'm telling you, and you don't skip any stages. If, if a player is skipping stages, if they're playing up in their division, if all of a sudden they're running around to play ITF tournaments and they haven't really proven themselves at the local level, you're, you're setting yourself up for a little bit of a disaster. And so my coaches made sure that I was managed very, very well. And quite honestly, I didn't really have the funding to be able to go out and play a lot of international competition. My junior career consisted of three ITF tennis tournaments, but because funds were a little bit limited, but also the, the way that I went about my junior tennis career and managed was, was a very, very good one for me. So basically I went through the stages locally and then went into sectionals and, and nationals. And when I was, when I could prove that I could do very well and go far or, or win those events, I then started playing men's tournaments because my coach said, well, if we're, if we're going to spend money and, 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 and try to see how good you can be, I would much rather you play men than to invest money in playing more juniors. And so then the money was spent in playing men's opens, obviously nationals, but also going and playing low level professional tennis tournaments and playing those types of players, which are basically college level players and also lower level players professionals that have ATP points. I remember when, when I was 16 years old, I was able to qualify into four futures level tournaments. They were either $10,000 tournaments or $15,000 tournaments. And that was a great accomplishment for me. 
at 16 years old. And then I would draw someone that was either 200 or 300 in the world on the, on the ATP tour. And obviously they were, they were a little strong for me, but I did play them tough, but they were, they were too strong for me. But for me to go in and win three or four matches and qualifying against men to me felt, I felt way, way better about myself that I was beating men instead of more juniors. So Mm -hmm. my, my junior career only, only consisted of three ITF tennis tournaments. And what they were was I drove to, uh, it was either a grade four, or grade five tournament in Hilton Head, South Carolina, because it was in the area and the expenses could, could, could stay down. Um, and I did well in that. I qualified and went far in the main draw, maybe quarterfinals or semifinals. Then because I won a super national in my last year of 18s, I then went and played the U.S. Open juniors, which I lost to a very... Um, to the number three player in the world in a very close match in three sets. So right then and there, it, t- it, it showed me that I could be one of, the, one of the best junior tennis players in the world without playing a lot of the ITF tennis tournaments and chasing the points. And then when I was a freshman in, at University of Miami, I got a wild card into the Orange Bowl, which was played down the street on Key Biscayne, where they play the Sony Open. And uh, I was able to defeat the number two player in the world, who was Janko Tipsarevich, and what it showed me was, you know what, I was one of the best junior tennis players in the world, which for me, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a great accomplishment, but my ultimate goal was to be a professional. So it was, just, it was just the route that I took to become a professional, and it, and it showed me that I had done great work and great training over the years, and, and that I was on my way to trying to become a professional tennis player, and that's really what it, what it, what it, what it showed me. And, uh, and I went along that process. But let's face it, for most of the kids, and, and I would say most of the parents that are following Parenting Aces, um, professional tennis isn't the goal. It's college tennis. And so, right. um, you know, so they're trying to set themselves up to get recruited by the best programs that will recruit them. And, you know, so how important is having an ITF ranking or ITF results in the recruiting process? Um, well, I, I speak to the, the parents of the children that I train, and, and I tell them that the college coaches, their job, they're, they're trying to recruit the best player for their program, whether it's through the ITF route or, or through the USTA route. And really – Going, going to play ITF tennis tournaments, they, they know the level of, of the player. So I don't, I don't really see – many times I don't see the benefit. You, you have children that are ranked three, four, five hundred in the world, 800 in the world, and the college coaches, they look, they, they look at what they're recruiting, whether you've played a USTA tournament or ITF tournaments. And, and I've had parents come up to me and say, my, my child will never go to a very good Division One college because they haven't played ITFs. And that's just not true. It's not accurate. The, the college coaches are looking for the best player and the best fit for their program, regardless of the route that your child has taken. So, you know, I, I really wanted to make that clear. It, it depends on how good your child is. That's really what it boils down to. And playing locally, nationally, internationally, usually doesn't have an impact on on how good the player is. I mean, if if we look um, just locally at Georgia Tech, Chris Eubanks, who right. I think he's like the number three collegiate player right now, his, his collegiate right. ranking through the ITA is number three. Um, that's right. a kid who played very few tournaments coming up through juniors. He right. did a lot of training and played a lot of yeah. practice matches. And he is doing incredibly well in college. He's doing well on the pro tour, the, the tournaments he's played. And, um, you know, he, he's been on the show too. So I urge, uh, I urge you guys to mm-hmm. go listen to the podcast with him. But, um, you know, he's had a very different pathway, a different route. And so right. it can be done without spending a ton of money. Right. Um, for sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I, I saw. I just saw that he had a fantastic professional event in Champaign, Illinois. Um, yeah. I do. I yep. do check to see what what's going on with uh, 
you know, with, with the professional tournaments, and I'm interested to see how the young Americans are doing coming up, and we, there's an excellent crop of players coming up. I had this discussion with a parent the other day that obviously I did a lot of training. I was in the hands of unbelievable coaches that trained the best players in the world and the best juniors and the best, best collegiate players in the country. And really, when, when I was getting ready for a super national tennis tournament, maybe it was an Easter Bowl, it was a super national hard courts, a, a super national clay courts, there were times that I was training months without playing one tennis tournament to get ready for these tournaments. And so when these tournaments were, were coming up on the calendar, I would maybe play one warm-up tournament. It could have been maybe a men's open or, or a sectional or whatever it shall be. But I trained for months to develop my game and develop my, my physical fitness, all the different aspects, and I was gearing up towards those events. It, the, the system is obviously different today, and, and children are playing a lot more tournaments. But it, to me, it's really not – that, that beneficial for a lot of the, the children to be playing that amount of tournaments. There, there are kids that are playing more tournaments in a year than I, at, when the, maybe from 14 to 16 or 17 years old than I did when I was a professional tennis player. I, I was a produced professional tennis player and there are kids that are playing more tennis tournaments at that age. than I did when I was a professional. And that's a big problem the, the development of the child is going to be, is, is going to be in trouble because they're not putting in those training hours and working on the things that really they need to be working on to become a much better tennis player. But once again, it just depends on the goals and dreams of that child. Depends really how good you want to be and, 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 and really how well managed that child is so that they can keep progressing in their, in their tennis career. It really depends on each individual. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good segue into our next topic, Todd. Um, <laughs> so, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna let us transition, and and the next thing we were gonna talk about is rituals and game plans and understanding how to play points and and basically being in control of a match and how to train for that. So, what are your thoughts on that as a coach, and and what are some specific ways that you work with your players to help them get better at those different aspects. Right. Well, the, the, the reason, the reason that I, I wanted to talk about this today on the show was I just spent um, time with one of my players in New York during one of his uh, big uh, sectional tennis tournaments. And uh, so it gave me, gave me some topics to speak about as, as well as I see these, these different aspects in tournaments in Florida as well. But what, what I started seeing was, there were children playing playing matches and everything and I couldn't figure out what kind of game plan that they were they were trying to to play um there was just a it was it was kind of, it was kind of sloppy if you want my honest opinion I couldn't figure out what they were trying to do I couldn't figure out how much time they were taking between each point it was going so fast that I'm not sure that any of the children were really even thinking and assessing what is going on on the court and and so that's that's really why I wanted to, to speak about that today, and and really these are things that are that are coached. These these, these, these things that I'm, that I'm speaking about, whether your child can follow a game plan, whether they can handle themselves emotionally, whether they can take their time and assess what is going on, if they can come up with solutions during their matches. These are all things that need to be developed if your child wants to be playing at a very good level of college tennis or a professional level of tennis. Um, so these 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 aspects are coached. They were they were coached when I when I was when I was training in, in my in my junior years. Um I was not just thrown on a court and said, Go play two sets and no one no one looked at me. Um so what what I think you're seeing is the kids have taken a lot of tennis lessons. They've been they've been on a court with, with four kids and they've played points, but really they're just running and hitting tennis balls and they don't really understand and they can't assess what is going on during a match and how to change the rhythm of the match, how to take their time and, and follow a game plan and understand that maybe they didn't follow the game plan for maybe a game or a couple points or even, you know, bunches of games. And so they're just running and, and, and playing tennis. And that really, you're not going to become a very, very high level tennis player playing like that. And so 
a lot a lot a lot of what's what's being spoken about in American tennis is that kids need to play a lot more matches. And 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 I agree. They they do need to compete a lot more and they need to understand how to compete, but it's also trained. And I'm and I'm not sure that that the children are being trained how to play certain patterns, what are their strengths and how are they using their strengths against other their opponents' weaknesses and um to me, this needs to be managed a lot better. There, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of kids are taking lessons. A lot of kids are in groups, and that, and that's that, that that's fine. But I'm not seeing how how any of that is transitioning over to the to the player understanding the game a lot better and understanding how they're going to become a much better player and 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 beat players that that are really competing for the same spots at, at the collegiate level. Mhm. And let's be clear, you're you're not talking about teaching gamesmanship or anything that's, you know, got a negative attached to it. You're talking about teaching players how to manage time on the court, how to how to approach each point, um the rituals that they should be engaging in between points, on changeovers, between sets, et cetera, right? Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, exactly. That's what, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the discipline of how your your son or daughter approaches each and every point, how they handle different situations, how well they compete, how how good their attitude is, how well really, and and how they understand how to actually construct tennis points on on, on the court, and especially in a pressure situation. Um, I'm not I'm not seeing, for example, many times. I'll be working with, with the players, and I want to see the same exact point constructed over and over and over again. And it takes a very high level of concentration, but that's how they're going to get better under, under, under that discipline. I don't want them getting up to the, serv- to the baseline, serving, hitting one ball, then grabbing the ball, serving, hitting a couple shots, grabbing the ball, serving, hitting a couple shots. That, to, to me, the, the player has really no understanding of how to be playing the game of tennis. And so you're going to get to a certain level and, and that's it. You're going to really just kind of stall in your tennis because the understanding and, and following game plans and understanding what, what, is, what is happening in a tennis match, there's no thought process. And if you really see the top tennis players in the world, they take their time. They, the rituals are exactly the same, whether they're going to return serve or whether they're going to serve themselves. Um, they bounce the ball the same way every single time. They take the, basically the same amount of time between each point, uh, basically all, around the same amount of time each point. And those rituals and those habits coached, and they're set, obviously. They're professionals. But th- those are set. And I'm not seeing that. So really, the, the player is, is, is kind of sloppy. The performances are up and down. And uh, I'm not sure how you become a very high-level tennis player without those disciplines being taught. And, and for the player to be really putting them into play each and every day in, in, in their practice. One of the things we were talking about before we went on the air was when you get to college, the way that the college game is being played now with no ad scoring, the doubles is one set <laughs> with no ad scoring. I mean, the right. matches are over in the blink of an eye, and you can't afford to have – a bad game or a string of bad right. points because there's really right. no time to recover from that. And so this whole idea of developing rituals and having a game plan and understanding how you need to approach each and every point becomes even more important. Right. No doubt. Um, I've had, I've had many, many times I've spoken to, the college players that, that, that I coach in their junior career and they come during their breaks and everything. And, and, and they've called me and said, I played really well. I lost, you know, three or four no ad points. And that's really how I lost, lost the match. So it comes down, comes down to a couple points each set. Obviously if, if, if both players are, are of similar levels and really, if you're not, if you're not thinking through these important points and understanding really how to play tennis and what works for you, you're, you're going to struggle in these very, very important times. And, and these are all things that, that need to be coached, in my opinion, and, and, need, and need to be trained. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's what's, what's going on. If, if, if a child is taking a tennis lesson, how many times do they actually 
go out and learn how to construct points in, in the tennis lesson. A lot of times they're working on a, a certain technique or movement or, or what or whatever it shall be. But really, when you're in a, when you're in a match or in a tournament, that's at, at that point it's about how well you construct points and how well you're using your strengths and making sure that you're covering up your weaknesses quite well and and and, and competing very very well and understanding and assessing and, and being being able to figure out and and be a great problem solver on the court there are going to be times where you're going to struggle with certain shots in, in your game and somehow you're going to have to figure out a way to win and that's becoming a, a great competitor and you're not going to become a great competitor by taking a bunch of te- technical lessons or or maybe being in, in in groups and everything and you're playing a bunch of points and playing up and downs and that's all fun and everything but that's that's not teaching you how to really compete and 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 have better results in tennis tournaments and one thing that, I mean, became very obvious, I would say, once my kid hit the 16s, I think is really when the light bulb came on for me, is at a certain point, all of the kids are really good. They all strike the ball well. They're all good movers. Right. They're all fit. So the intangibles are what makes or breaks you know, the match and the intangibles include things like understanding point construction, understanding how to manage between points and side changes, et cetera, et cetera. So specifically, how do you coach that? What are some of the things you do, Todd, with your players to help them learn these things? Right. Well, quite honestly, we we work on very certain patterns that that they're gonna that they're gonna need to become very used to, and and make sure that it's the bread and butter of their game, and they don't deviate from those patterns. I don't care if they win or lose, maybe the elevens we play in practice or the sets. I want to see these players play really the same point over and over and over again, and I don't care that the person across the net knows what's coming. It, it makes to me it makes it makes no difference. I want to see if the if the if the junior tennis player has the discipline and the concentration to be able to play the same point over and over and over again, whether it's the same point from the do side or the same point from the ad side, and that's basically how we go about go about constructing a game to make sure that it works when, for that for that type of tennis player. When you say the same point, you mean, for example. If the serve comes to your backhand, you're then going to go cross court three times um, until you get the short ball, and then you're going to run around and take a forehand inside out for the winner or something along those lines. Is that what you're saying? That's right. That's right. If you, okay. if you, go, if you go watch a junior tennis match or a tennis tournament or even a practice, the parents should see how many times that their child or other children can actually have the discipline and concentration to play the same point over and over again. And really a lot, a lot of them, they, they, they have big time trouble doing that. Many of the phone calls that I get from, from junior tennis parents are my kid is my kid. I think is, is good technically. You know, I think, I think they're a good athlete, but they really, they don't understand the game of tennis. These are the phone calls I get quite often. And and so, when I ask when I ask the the junior tennis player if, if I go and I watch them play a match or whatever, I many times can't figure out what 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 they're trying to do on the court. How are they trying to use their strengths? How are they trying to construct points? They're really just picking a spot and hitting, and that's what you do in your drills. And okay, that that that's fine. You're maybe trying to hit targets or work on certain techniques, but this is totally different about how to how to compete and how to construct points. If you watch any of the best tennis players in the world, it is very concrete how they are constructing points. And uh, obviously, the, the children they need to study those professional tennis matches and see and see what's going on. But also, it, it needs to be it needs to be coached because if if you have this type of discipline of training, your matches are going to become much easier, much less stressful because your discipline of how you construct a point and your level of concentration are going to be way higher than the person across the net. Why do you think many junior coaches, and I really want to say most junior coaches, but I'm going to be kind and say many, don't coach this way? 
Um, honestly, I don't know. I mean, do you think it's they don't have an understanding themselves, or you think it's laziness, or I mean, or I you think, think it's? Just, I think what's happened. I think what's happened in the, in in the United States is that obviously it's a big business. The tennis business is now a big business. It take it costs a lot of money for a junior tennis player to be to be developed. Um, I think that this this maybe isn't fun for for many kids, right? I mean, it's not fun to be playing the same point over and over again and have that type of discipline and concentration. It's a lot more fun to be, you know, playing games or up and downs and and those types of things. That that that's fun. But remember, it, it all depends on your on your goals and dreams. Um, I think when you take a tennis lesson, how many how many tennis lessons have you actually seen where the coach is teaching the student how to construct points properly, as well as how to compete properly? A lot a lot of times they're just putting the, the child through drills. Okay, and that's 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 good too. I mean it's not bad, but what and and really with with groups with, when you have groups of maybe four kids on a court. If, if they're going to go into a point situation, then one kid, actually two children are waiting their turn to play points, but really they need to be, they need to be coached on how to really play the patterns of play that work for that specific player. And, and that, that, that is vitally important that many of the kids that I've trained over the years, they, they've come and, and, and I can't figure out what they're trying to do in, in a match situation. And so I, I start to speak, speak to them about, well, the child you're playing across the net, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What are you trying to do? And they have, they have no answer. This, this is, this mm-hmm. is, this game takes a lot of, a lot of thought and a lot of thinking and understanding the moment and coming up with, with great solutions. Maybe if, if one of your shots is off that day, you have to be really coming up with a lot of great, great solutions on how to fix so that you can co- be the best player you can, but also come out the winner that day, even though maybe you didn't have your A game. And that, and that's, those are things that have to be taught if, if the player wants to progress in their, in their tennis. One thing that I've seen just in my own kids experience is, you know, let's say your kid starts out playing just for fun, right? They just, you know, they're four years old and you stick them in a neighborhood, you know, group and kick, hits and giggles as they call it. And, um, and over the years, you know, your child maybe has a pivotal experience that causes them to really want to up their game and up their training. And right. so they take it to the next level. They they get with a coach that, you know, fixes their technique and yada, yada, yada. And for whatever reason, it's time to change coaches again. Uh, and there's a myriad right. of reasons why that might happen. So they come to a new coach, let's say they're 13, 12, 13, 14 years old at this point. They come to a new coach. Their technique is pretty good. Their movement's pretty good because the last coach fixed all that stuff. So this new coach that gets them assumes that because all those things are good, that they have the other stuff too that you're talking about. They have the understanding. They've been taught these patterns and yada, yada, yada. And so – Instead of asking the question, you know, why are you doing that? What are you looking to accomplish out there as you're saying you do? These coaches just assume that the kid's doing what they're doing for a reason without asking. And so the kid goes on for years with people assuming they know this stuff when, in fact, they've never been taught it. Nobody's ever asked the question or addressed it with them. And all of a sudden, like what happened with my kid, you know, they're 16, 17 years old, and all of a sudden the coach does ask the question, and they don't have an answer. And from the parental side, holy cow, you know, it's just infuriating to realize that your kid's gone this long and this far in their development, and nobody's taught them this basic stuff. Yeah. um, Yeah, I deal with this all the time. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure you do. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a huge part of my business, obviously. Like I said, each, each case is different. So a child may need 
their forehand fixed. They may, they may need to learn how to move better. They may need to become fitter. They may, I, and there, there's so many different cases, but what I can tell you is that the vast majority, if not maybe all of the kids that I've trained, they, they don't really understand the game of tennis. Well, they don't. And that's, that's a, that's a huge thing that, that I'm teaching on a, on a daily basis. Well, why are, why are we doing these certain types of drills? Why are we playing these certain types of patterns? Why did I put these, these targets in these certain spots and why are we playing this, these same points over and over and over again until I can duplicate it over and over again. These are the things that, that, I, that I work with the, the players on every single day. Um, so, and, and a lot of them don't have this background. A lot of kids have a background of, well, their techniques look, you know, pretty good for the most part. They've taken a lot of tennis lessons and they've, they've been in groups. So they've, they've run around and they've played some points and and that that's that's the vast that's the vast majority of of the children um also if if coaches aren't going to watch their players compete in in tennis tournaments i'm not sure how you know what to work on the next week after that tennis tournament uh, i mean are, are they constructing that. points <laughs> yeah are, thank are, you yeah, for are, saying are they, that are, are the children yeah are the children acting properly are they constructing points properly are they taking their time are they managing i have i've had kids come to me that have, and the parents have spent lots of money on their tennis career, and the coach has maybe seen them play one match in, in five years, in six years, and I go and I start working with that player, and I've watched more matches in maybe the first week or two than their previous coach did in, you know, multiple years. And, I'm, it, and mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's, it, you know, whatever. It, 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 it is what it is, but I don't know how to – have that child progress if you're not watching them in, in a pressure filled environment, because the only way to know if, if that child is progressing and, and applying the things that they're working on, whether it's a, a technical thing or, or understanding tennis and playing certain patterns and these types of things. If, if those things are not coming out in a pressure situation, they need to continue to be worked on until that child feels comfortable to bring them out in a tournament situation. And until they do, that needs to be worked on all the time, every single day, until they can bring it out. Then maybe you can move on to something else. So let me just now tie together <laughs> the beginning of our conversation today with this. So the question becomes, you know, it's so expensive to have the coach come out and watch the matches. Well, guess what? If you're playing tournaments locally, whether it's junior tournaments or adult tournaments, whatever it is, if you're local, it's not nearly as expensive to have the coach come out and watch. And so to complain that the coach isn't traveling hither and yon with your child to watch matches becomes kind of a moot point if you are taking your child through the proper progression, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if if your if your child is not dominating locally, they shouldn't be going anywhere else, in my opinion, until they can prove and, step by step. Then then there's a discussion. Right, but but the point being that if your child is competing locally, there are plenty of opportunities for that coach to get out there relatively inexpensively. I mean, obviously the parents need to pay the coach for their time to be out there, but you're not paying travel right. expenses. You're not paying, you know, missed private sessions that the coach would have been teaching had he stayed in town, those types of things. So all of a sudden right. they're really, it, it does away with that one big barrier of, you know, I can't afford for the coach to go with my kid. So well, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just... yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, if, if if a child is playing locally, and your coach is 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 not going, I'm not saying they have to go to every single tournament, every single match, but if they're not seeing, and they're not coming to watch your child play, in 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 tournaments, should you really be investing in in practices with them? I'm not I'm not sure that you should, because really. The, the children are playing tournaments so that they can have results and so that they can have their dreams and goals become a reality. So 
if if a child is going to going to play a tennis tournament and the coach isn't isn't showing up to see how that player is progressing, how they're handling all these different things in tennis tournaments, how they're warming up and how they're just doing everything at a tennis tournament, then I don't know. Does does the coach care about your child? I'm not, you know, I don't I don't know. I mean, I'm just saying it honestly. I go to tournaments all the time in, in the area here. I don't I don't travel that much anymore. I rarely travel, but I go and monitor to see how my players are are progressing and how they are applying the things that, that, that are being taught in practice or else I don't even know what to work on the next week. Right. They may say, Oh, I had a trouble with my forehand or server or whatever it is. But many times the information coming from a parent or the junior tennis player, I see things differently than they do. So I may agree or I may say, well, no, it's, 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 it's more kind of of this or that or an emotional thing or a technical thing or whatever it is. But I don't know that unless I'm actually there watching. Right. Right. All right. Well, we're, we're down to our last mm, less than 10 minutes. So I want to make sure we touch on one last topic and that is um, the topic of fitness and off court training and how that is managed. And it's a big issue. Um, You know, we hear it talked about a lot, especially on the men's side, but also on the women's side um, the fitness level of these players and keeping them free from injury and, and all of that. So please share your thoughts on that. Okay. Well, coming, coming from experience, I had a, I obviously had a, had a ATP tennis career that was riddled with injuries. And now that I'm older, I look back on the types of training that I may have done with trainers and it really wasn't beneficial. I ended up, really injured, getting injured quite often. And I'm not talking about little poles. I'm talking about serious injuries, you know, a lot, a lot of torn muscles and those types of things. I look back on my physical training. I'm like, goodness gracious, I really should not have done that. But you know, the, the physical trainer tells you what to do and you do it. There's a lot of trainers that are trained for other sports, baseball, football, soccer, which are great, but tennis is a whole different animal. And, and what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a lot of kids that are having trouble moving properly on a tennis court, having proper leg strength, having proper balance, being light on their feet. So, and, and a, lot of, a lot of these things, they can be worked on off the court, but a lot of times the children aren't doing enough sports-specific training. They may be running a lot of meters. They may be lifting weights. They may be doing a lot of things but their on-court movements and agility and lateral movements, forward, back, explosiveness, light on their feet, these things are nowhere to be found. And so they may get stronger. Their bodies may, may, may look stronger, but it's not really translating into their tennis. And so a lot of the, a lot of the things that, that, I, that I work on with, with the players that I train are sports-specific movements. I want them – to be moving properly and efficiently and have the proper leg strength so that they can load and hit a ball properly. And so those, those things are, are really, th- those things were very much a big part of my training growing up. And, um, and, and really when I went to college and onto the professional tour, that's when I started venturing into, into other things of, lifting heavy and, and doing and doing a lot of things that I look back on now that were not very good for for my tennis career. So a lot a lot of the a lot of the times if you look at any of the videos I put on on, on the internet or, or whatever it is, these are very, very sports specific movements and things that your child is gonna be doing in their matches and obviously in their practices so that they can become a much better tennis player. Um so those, 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 that's really how I run the fitness program where, where I train the players. I don't, I don't really have any physical trainers coming in because there's, there's very few that I, that I know of that really understand these movements and everything that a, that a young junior tennis player needs. They, they may have a, a, a background in, in physical training, but not physically training tennis players. And so that's why I'm very, very cautious about what I'm doing with, with the players that I train on a daily basis, but also making sure that the injuries are, are down, make sure that 
that they are well taken care of so that they can have a long lasting tennis career. And so that they don't have the problems that I, that I really had from when I was a professional tennis player. Let me just throw out there that Mark Kovacs, who founded the ITPA, the, I, I believe, I, I'm hoping I'm getting this right, International Tennis Performance Association. Um, the ITPA trains fitness trainers in tennis-specific exercises and training protocols. And Mark is based here in Atlanta. Um, the, the man is so busy. I've been trying to get him back on the show. He was on a few years ago, and I've been trying to get him back right. on, but he's constantly on the road. But um, so just for the parents listening, if you are questioning whether your child's fitness trainer or tennis coach who is providing fitness training is doing the right stuff with your child, you can simply ask the question if they're certified through ITPA, and that's an easy way to find out if they have the knowledge uh, for tennis-specific training. Or if, you know, if you're looking for somebody, you can go to the ITPA website and search for a certified professional in your area. So I just want to throw that out. Um, that's certainly not the only place to find competent trainers, but it is one way to look for them. All right. All right. Yeah, I, I know Mark, uh, and he and he's fantastic. He was with the USGA here in Florida, and I know him well. And he is very, very knowledgeable in in in, in these areas that I'm speaking about. Which we need more. We need we need more more people like him that are willing to uh, you know do this for a living and 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 really do it specifically for tennis. Because what what, what I'm seeing is. You know, a lot, a lot, a lot of young players having serious injuries, and and that that really it, it shouldn't happen as often as it's happening, if if the proper physical development is going on. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why when I got off the tour, I went and got a body work degree, is because I really wanted. For me, it was obviously it was very interesting, especially having a lot of injuries when I was on the tour. But it was very interesting. Uh, interesting for me to understand what needs to be done for, for junior tennis players to move properly and then, and the types of, of movements and, and how to train them properly so that they don't have these problems and that they can move efficiently and, and, and have the proper strength to be able to play high, high level tennis. So as a coach, Todd, um, you know, again, trying to, to link all these pieces of our conversation today, um, when you're teaching your players these rituals and patterns and all of that, does that include pre-match warm-up, between-match warm, you know, cool down and warm up again for the next one, end of the day cool down and stretching? Um, is that all part of these rituals that you're talking about? Absolutely. I mean, if if if, if you're a tennis professional and you're taking on high-level juniors there are no steps that can be skipped. So I'm, I'm talking about as, as well as what you're talking about, the, the warm up. Um, you know, obviously then you play your match, the cool down, making sure that they're taking care of their bodies, the nutrition. Um, even I was just in New York at a tournament and the boy I was with, he was doing fitness during the, during the tournament. And that's one of the articles I, I wrote and, and spoke about as well is that I wanted to make sure that he was, feeling good and quick because he's so used to training a certain amount of hours that matches are actually easy. They should be easy physically for him if the proper training is done in, in your practice. So the body is, is used to, you know, training very hard. So I wanted to make sure that his fast twitch muscle fibers were firing and that he felt quick when he was going to be playing his matches and obviously to maintain a level of fitness so that when he came back to Florida, now he's, he's, he's really, you know, he maintained a certain level of fitness, which is, which is great as well. But, um, you know, it, com it comes down many times to the management of, of the player and uh, all these different aspects are crucial if the player really wants to be a high level college player or a professional tennis player. Or even a high level junior. I mean, quite honestly, you know, right. I remember with when my kids started going deep in tournaments and he would be, so flipping exhausted by the time he got to the right. semis, you know, and right. so trying to figure out how do you stay up for 
six matches over three days? You know, how do you, how do you take care of your body so that you have as much energy for the final that you did for round one? And right. it's, it's a training thing. Yeah. Well, well, it is. For sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. If, if, if you're having problems physically in tournaments, your, your preparation and training is, is probably off. The tournament should actually be very easy physically. Um, mentally, ter- tournaments can be very draining because you're concentrating and, 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 and doing all the things that we spoke about on, on, on this show. But physically, you should not have problems in tournaments with fatigue, you know, may, may, maybe cramping, wh- whatever it shall be. If, if you're having those problems, then something is off. Maybe you're not training well, maybe you're not training hard enough or what, whatever it shall be. But the tournaments, because you get you get a certain amount of time between each point, the 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 the, the tournament matches they that should feel easy to you because your drilling and everything in 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 practice should be so demanding that and and the drill should go on for a certain amount of time that when you get these breaks between each point in a tennis tournament that 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 should be very easy for you to recover and play the next point and obviously match after match that should be very easy for you. Great point. Well, we are at the end of our hour. That went so fast. Um, and yeah. given the fact that my kids are in town, I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm going to wrap this up with you this time, but I know I will have you back in a month. And for my listeners, you know, you get, you're going to get taught a lot. So, um, Todd, I really look forward to continuing our conversations and, um, if anyone has topics that you'd like us to address, uh, feel free to reach out to me, to reach out to Todd. Um, we're both on all the social media outlets, and my contact info is all over parentingaces.com, so feel free to reach out with any topic ideas. And uh, meanwhile, everybody have a wonderful Thanksgiving, whether you're traveling to a tournament or you're taking the weekend to just be home with family. I hope everyone enjoys uh, overeat a little bit, but not so much that you're in the fetal position all weekend. <laughs> and um, I just hope that everybody enjoys this time. And, and Todd, thanks again for being with us this week, and I look forward to continuing our conversation. Yeah, thanks so much, Lisa. I can't wait to be on again. That was fun. Great. Thanks. Thank you. And to my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in to Parenting Aces. Be sure to check out our website, parentingaces.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we'll see you next time on the Parenting Aces radio show. Have a great week. When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be confusing. Like Swedish techno confusing. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Dance with me, purple cow. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Ooh, you lovely cow. Geico makes it easy. With 24-7 access, all you have to do is go to Geico.com and you can save money on car insurance. It just makes sense. Unlike, you know. Dance with me, purple cow. I like your mood.